During the bombardment, we were all gripped by an extreme and exhausting tension. Some of us attempted predictions, only to be contradicted by events a few moments later. The veteran smoked nervously, continuously begging us to shut up. Krauss had drawn apart and sat muttering in a corner. Perhaps he was praying. In the evening, one of the counterattack units visited us and installed an anti-tank gun nearby. A colonel came by a little later and tested the new supports we had put in to prevent any further collapse of the roof. Well done, he said. He made the rounds of our little group, offering each man a cigarette. Then he rejoined his unit, which was part of the Gross Deutschland, a little closer to the front. It grew dark. Through the tattered silhouettes of the remaining orchard trees, the horizon glowed red with fire. The battle was not yet over, and the extreme tension it generated was almost unbearable. We had to take turns standing guard outside, and no one had a good night's sleep. We were rounded up well before dawn and forced to abandon our well-organized hole and proceed further into Soviet territory. The German advance had not been stopped. During our advance, we crossed a frightful slaughtering ground of Hitler Jugend, mixed into the dirt by the bombardment of the day before. Each step made us realize with fresh horror what could become of our miserable flesh. Somebody should have buried all this mincemeat so we wouldn't have to look at it, Halls grumbled. Everyone laughed as if he'd just said something funny. We crossed a piece of ground so heavily pitted with shell holes it was hard to imagine that anyone who'd been on it could have survived, and an open-air hospital behind an embankment from which the shrieks and groans came so thick and fast it sounded like a scalding room for pigs. We were staggered by what we saw. I thought I would faint. Lindbergh was crying with terror. We crossed the enclosure with our eyes fixed on the sky, seeing as if in a dream. Young men howling with pain with crushed forearms or gaping abdominal wounds, staring with incomprehension at their own guts puffing out the piece of cloth which had been hastily flung over them. Immediately beyond the hospital we had to wade across a canal. The cool water which rose over our waists made us feel much better. On the far bank the springing turf was strewn with Russian bodies. A Soviet tank twisted and blackened by fire stood beside a big gun and the shattered bodies of its operators. To our left, in the northeast, the battle continued more fiercely than ever. We thought we heard a groan from one of the Rus' Cyan gunners, and went over to a man smeared with blood who was leaning gasping against one of the wheels of the gun carriage. One of our men uncorked his drinking bottle and lifted the head of the dying man. The Russian stared at us through enormous eyes, widened by terror or shock. He cried out, and then his head fell back, thudding against the metal of the wheel. He was dead. We continued across a series of rolling wooded hills, where our front-line troops were regrouping and catching a moment's rest in the shade of the trees. Many men wore bandages, whose whiteness stood out sharply against their gray, dusty faces. We were rapidly regrouped, called out, and sent to precise locations. The two grenadiers who had joined us were sent somewhere else, while our eighth group was completed by a new pair of strays. Unfortunately, the Stabsfeldwebel, whom I've mentioned before, and who had only one more day of life, was made the leader of our group. We were swiftly attached to an armored section, which transported us on the backs of their machines to the edge of an enormous plateau, which seemed to stretch into infinity. We jumped off the backs of the moving panzers to join a group of soldiers lying flat at the bottom of a shallow trench, already several fifty millimeter. Rounds fired directly at us by enemy artillery had brought it home to us that we were in the front line. The tanks turned back and vanished under the trees some fifty yards behind us. We plunged down beside the fellows who were already there, who seemed none too cheerful. The Russian fire followed the tanks and was lost in the brush. Our idiot Stabsfeldwebel was already feeling uneasy about the distractions of the neighborhood and was discussing them with a very young lieutenant. Then the young officer waved to his men, who followed him toward the woods, running and bent nearly double. The Popovs, who must have been watching, sent over five or six rounds aimed directly at them. Some of their bullets landed very close to us. Once again, we were alone, nine of us in a hole, facing the Soviet lines. The sun was directly above us. Get cracking on that hole now, shouted the Stabs in a perfect parade ground voice. We began to turn over the dusty Ukrainian soil with our short pick spades. We barely had time to speak. The heat of the sun was crushing and increased our lassitude. We'll probably die of exhaustion before anything else has a chance to get us, Hall said. I give up. 
My head is killing me, I answered with a sigh. But our bastard stabs kept after us, staring anxiously out over the grassless plain, which stretched into the distance as far as the eye could see. We had just finished setting up our two spandaus when the noise of tanks rolling over the brush behind us made us shudder. On that magnificent summer afternoon, German tanks were once again leaving the shade and driving toward the east. From behind them, entire regiments, bent double, passed us and vanished into a wall of dust, which hid them from view. About five minutes later the Russians began a bombardment of unprecedented ferocity. Everything became opaque, and the sun vanished from our eyes, which had become enormous with fright. The storm cloud of dust was relieved only by continuous red flashes, shooting up against the darker masses of trees eighty or a hundred yards away. The earth shook harder than I'd yet felt it do, and the brush behind us burst into flame. Screams of fear froze in our constricted throats. Everything seemed displaced. The air all around us was filled with flying clods, mixed with fragments of metal and fire. Kraus and one of the newcomers were buried in a landslide before they even knew what had happened to them. I threw myself into the deepest corner of our hole and stared uncomprehendingly at the stream of earth flooding towards our shelter. I began to howl like a madman. Hal's pressed his filthy head against mine and our helmets clattered together like two mess tins. Hal's face was transfigured by terror. It's the... end, he gasped, his words broken up by the explosions, which took away our breath. Overwhelmed by horror, I could only agree. Suddenly a human figure crashed into our hole. We both trembled with desperation and fright. Then a second human shape joined the first, in a great leap. This time our huge eyes took in that these were two of our own men. One of the newcomers shouted to us through his frantic gasp for breath. My whole company was wiped out, it's terrible. He carefully lifted his head just over the edge of the embankment as a series of explosions began to rip through the air beside us. His helmet and a piece of his head were sent flying, and he fell backward with a horrifying cry. His shattered skull crashed into Hals's hands and we were splattered with blood and fragments of flesh. Halls threw the revolting cadaver as far as he could and buried his face in the dirt. The explosions had become so violent that we felt the ground all around us must be shifting. Outside our hole on the torn and ravaged plain, we could hear an engine roaring out of control. Then there was another explosion, more violent than all the others, and an enormous flash of light swept the edge of our trench. Our two spandaus fell back on top of us in a wave of loose earth. Those who weren't struck dumb with fright howled like madmen. We're finished. Uh, Mama, it's me. No, no. We'll be buried alive. You help. But nothing we said could put an end to this hell which seemed to go on forever. About thirty soldiers on the run plunged in with us. We were kicked and shoved without mercy, as everyone tried to burrow down as deeply as possible. Whoever was left on top was finished. The earth all around us was pocked with thousands of shell holes, and from each of these we could hear the sounds of fleeing soldiers looking for refuge. But the cruel Russian soil was torn by fresh salvos, and those who thought they'd been saved continued to die. We heard the roar of airplane engines, and cheers for the Luftwaffe arose from thousands of desperate men. The bombardment continued for a few more seconds, and then decreased dramatically. The officers who were still alive blew their whistles for retreat and the men packed into our hole poured out like rabbits chased by a ferret. We were about to follow when our Stabsfeld Weebel, who hadn't yet been killed, shouted loudly after us. Not you, we're here to stop a Russian counteroffensive. Get your guns ready to fire. Six Hitler Jugend cadavers were lying on the bottom of the trench, which had completely changed shape. To the left, one end was caved in and Krauss's boots were sticking out of two cubic yards of gray dirt. The other grenadier had been completely buried. With the help of the veteran whose face was streaming with blood, we were able to get the FM back into place. The plane, which had been altered beyond recognition, was scarred with holes and lumps, as if giant moles had been at work. Wherever one looked, there were smoke and flame and a scattering of motionless bodies. In the distance, through spirals of dust and smoke, we could see geysers of fire from the bombs which our Milos were dropping on the Russian artillery. It looked as though we'd hit a couple of their ammunition dumps. The shock waves from those explosions engulfed the earth and sky in an extraordinary intensity of light and displacement of air.
I... Those bastards, shouted the Ober, and now they're getting what they deserve. Our mellows turned back to the west and the Russian artillery opened up again. They were concentrating particularly on the panzers, which were retreating in disorder, with at least half their number destroyed. Although my left arm had almost been broken when the gang of panic-stricken soldiers jumped into the trench on top of us, I had felt nothing at the time. Now it was beginning to cause me violent pain, which hovered beside me like a supplementary presence, but I was too busy to pay much attention to it. The bombardment was continuing to the north and to the south, and then passed over us once again, intensifying and spreading its complement of pain and terror. Our group of stupefied men could breathe only with difficulty, like an invalid who gets up after a long illness to find he has lost both strength and wind. We were all unable to speak. There was nothing to say then about the hours we had just lived through, and there is no way of describing them now with the vehemence and force they require. Nothing remains for those who have survived such an experience but a sense of uncontrollable imbalance and a sharp sordid anguish which reaches across the years, unblunted and undiminished, even for someone like me, who is attempting to translate it into words, although a precise and appropriate vocabulary remains elusive. Abandoned by a god in whom many of us believed, we lay prostrate and dazed in our demi. Tomb. From time to time, one of us would look over the parapet to stare across the dusty plain into the east, from which death might bear down on us at any moment. We felt like lost souls, who had forgotten that men are made for something else, that time exists and hope and sentiments other than anguish, that friendship can be more than ephemeral, that love can sometimes occur, that the earth can be productive and used for something other than burying the dead. We were madmen, gesturing and moving without thought or hope. Our legs and arms were numbed by hours of crowding and shoving against neighbors, living or dead, who were taking up too much room. The Stabsfeld Weeble repeated mechanically that we must maintain our position, but each new series of explosions sent us plunging to the bottom of our hole. Night fell before we realized day had ended, and with darkness our terror returned. Lindbergh, whose nervous condition was alarming, had collapsed into a kind of stupor, which for the moment made him oblivious of hell. The Sudeten was almost as badly affected. Fee had begun to tremble like someone in a fit, and to vomit uncontrollably. Madness had invaded our group and was gaining ground rapidly. In a state of semi-delirium I saw a giant whom I had known in another time as Hal's leap to his machine gun and fire at the sky, which continued to pour down its rain of flame and metal. I also saw the stabs, seized by a kind of dementia, beat the ground with his clenched fist, and then deliberately turn on the surviving grenadier and pound him. The grenadier, who had seemed to be functioning normally until that moment, simply stared at the stabs like someone in a trance and then burst into tears. I could hear the millions of echoes ringing through the ground with an almost infernal precision, and I felt that I was going to faint. I stood up, totally unaware of what I was doing, shouting curses and obscenities at the sky. I had reached the edge of the abyss, like all my companions, and like them I was nearly finished. My rage burned like a straw fire. Consuming my last reserves of strength, my head began to swim, and I fell forward against the edge of the trench. My mouth, which was wide open, filled with dirt. I began to vomit, and knew I wouldn't be able to stop until I had emptied myself completely. I waded through my vomit with my trembling hands stretched out in front of me, reaching for the support of the crumbling parapet. A white flash, like an element of a nightmare, lit the darkness which had enveloped use and kept me from losing consciousness. I slowly raised my ease above the level of the trench wall, to follow the Russian flary as it fell to the ground. During those moments I felt strangely certain that I was at home, that none of my surroundings existed, and that the descending flare was really a falling star. I remained in my stupor for a long time, while the explosions continued to compress my lungs. Some men stood in one position for hours, asleep on their feet with their ease wide open. Finally, toward midnight, everything fell silent. However, no one moved. We all felt so weakened that movement was beyond the limit of possibility. Finally, the veteran was able to make us pay attention. Don't go to sleep, boys. This is when Ivan will attack. The stab stared at him with troubled eyes. He stood up and leaned against the trench wall. A few minutes later his head fell forward, and he was lost in paralytic sleep.
The veteran continued to exhort us, but the six of us who were left received his pleas with a silence as absolute as the silence of our eight corpses. Sleep was crushing us, as the guns had not quite managed to do. If the Russians had chosen that moment to attack, they would undoubtedly have saved a great many lives on their side. Our advance interception positions were manned only by sleepers and dead men. Although there must have been more noise from the big guns and more flares, our ears picked up nothing for the next four whores. The Stabsfeld Weibel was the first to wake. When we opened our eyes, we found him leaning over the Sudeten, who was sleeping beside him. The Sudeten had just cried out, which must have waked the Stabs. We felt so ground down by exhaustion that every gesture made us grimace with pain. The sky once again was turning pink, and we could already see the chaos scattered across the plain. Everything was calm, and we couldn't hear a sound. We stared out at the enormous space surrounding us. The horizon was almost a perfect circle, losing its line only in the hedge of woods to the north and to the south. We got out, some tins of food, and tried to eat and talk a little. That's right, you should build up your strength, joked the Stabs, who was living through his last moments. I'd be surprised if this quiet lasted. Maybe it will, though, someone else said. That show yesterday must have done in quite a few fellows. We might even get two or three days like this. I doubt it, said the Stabs. The Fuhrer has given the order to march east, and nothing can stop our troops now. The offensive will begin as soon as the sun is up. Do you really think so? asked Lindbergh, excited as usual when something seemed to be going our way. Will our troops be able to knock out those damned Russian guns? If it starts up again, Hells muttered to me, I'll go right off my rocker. Or be killed, I answered. We can't expect the same luck we had yesterday. Hals stared at me as he chewed. The Stabs, Lindbergh, and the surviving Grenadier were still talking, while Hals and I traded pessimistic predictions. Only the veteran went on eating in silence, his eyes red from sleeplessness fixed on the morning star. You too, said the Stabs, pointing to Hals and me. You keep your eyes open for another couple of hours, while the rest of us try to get some sleep. But first, we have to get rid of these stiffs. He waved at the eight mutilated corpses, which were already beginning to swarm with big blue flies. We watched the dead being stripped of their tags. For once, we were not playing Undertaker's assistant, and guard duty seemed like a stroke of luck. The same curses and exclamations seemed to occur to survivors every time they had to deal with the remains of their slaughtered comrades. The fuck it, this fellow weighs a ton. My God, he would have been better off if they'd finished him right away. Look at that. And then the metallic click as the identity tag slid off. Pach, he's swimming in shit. We looked away with indifference. Death had lost any dramatic importance for us. We were used to it. While the others were shifting the carrion, Hals and I continued to discuss our chances of survival. And hands and feet hurt more than other places, but aren't really serious. I wonder what happened to Olensheim. Broken arm, I heard. How's your arm? My shoulder hurts like hell. <laughs> Behind our backs, the others were hard at their filthy work. Heinz Veller, 1925, unmarried. Poor fellow. Let's see your shoulder, Howells said. Maybe you're badly hurt. I don't think so. Just a bruise, I said, unfastening my harness. I was about to pull the cloth away from my shoulder when a roll of thunder shook the pure morning air. A second later, a hail of Russian shells fell all around us, and once again we collapsed in terror at the bottom of our hole. My God, someone shouted. It's starting again. Hals was moving closer to me, through a shower of flying clods. He had just opened his mouth to say something when a violent explosion very near us drowned the sound of his voice. We'll never be able to hold on, he said. We'd better get out. A shell fell so close to us that the gray earth wall of the trench glowed red in the light of its flames. A thick cloud of smoke enveloped us, and cubic yards of earth fell into our holes. We could hear cries of fright and then the voice of the stabs. Anyone hit? God, shouted the veteran through a spasm of coughing. Where the hell's our artillery? Lindbergh had begun to tremble again. Then the Russian fire stopped. The veteran peered carefully out, and after him, our seven heads rose above the rampart. Westered at the plain, which was still scattered with trailing clouds of dust. In the distance, besides the wood, someone was howling. They must be running short of shells, said the stabs, grinning. Otherwise, they wouldn't have stopped so quickly.
The veteran looked at him with his habitual resigned expression. I was just thinking the same thing about our artillery, stabs Feldweebel. I was wondering why they weren't firing. We're preparing an offensive, and that's why our side is quiet. Soon we'll see our tanks. The veteran stared at the horizon. I'm sure. The stabs went on and that our offensive will begin again any minute now. But we were watching the veteran. His eyes were growing wider and wider, and so was his mouth, which seemed ready to howl. The stabs had shut up, too. We all followed the direction of our gunner's eyes. In the remote distance, a thin black line stretched from one end of the horizon to the other and was moving toward us like a wave rolling toward the shore. We stood watching for a moment. The line was dense and somehow unreal. Then the veteran shouted in a voice which paralyzed us with fear. It's the Siberians! They're here! There must be at least a million of them! He gripped the butt of his FM and a demented laugh burst through his clenched teeth. In the distance, a confused tumult of thousands of roaring voices swelled like a hurricane wind. Every man to his post, shouted the stabs, whose eyes remained fixed as if hypnotized on the irresistible Soviet tide. We had all picked up our guns like automatons and braced our elbows against the parapet. Hales was trembling like a leaf, and Lindbergh, his number two man, seemed unable to handle the belt of seven sevens. Get closer to me, Hal shouted. Get closer or I'll kill you. Lindbergh's face was quivering as if he were about to burst into tears. The veteran wasn't shouting anymore. His gun was on the crook of his shoulder, his finger was on the trigger, and his teeth were clenched tightly enough to break. The Soviet war cry was growing continuously louder and more distinct. It was like a long shout, muffled by its great volume. We remained frozen by the danger, unable to judge its magnitude. Our stupor was too great. We were like paralyzed mice facing a snake. Then Lindbergh broke down. He began to cry and shout, and left his post, throwing himself down on the trench floor. They'll kill us, they'll kill us, we'll all be killed. Get up, shouted the stabs. Get back to your post or I'll shoot you right now. He dragged him to his feet, but Lindbergh had gone as limp as a rag and was streaming with tears. You bastard, oh, shouted Howells. Get killed then, I'll take care of this damn thing myself. By now we could hear the Russian cries distinctly. A huge, continuous, Ura. Maman? I thought to myself. Maman? Aura, Ura Pobieta, muttered the veteran. Just get a little closer. The human wave was now about four hundred yards from us. We could also hear the throb of engines and see three planes, high in the brightening sky. Planes, said the Sudeten. But we'd all noticed them already. Our anxious eyes left the Russian horde for a moment. The airplane engines were screaming as the planes dived down at top speed. Messerschmitts, shouted the stabs. What guts! Hurrah! we all shouted. Hurrah for the Luftwaffe! The three planes were strung out over the huge Russian thrust, spraying it with death. This seemed to be a signal for our mortars to open fire. They were hidden in the brush and had lengthened their range. The Spandaus, which had survived the bombardment, began to fire, too, while the planes dived down, stimulating our troops to a feverish pitch of courage. I could feel the FM cartridges running through my hand at a dizzying speed. One clip was emptied, and we started another, some of the big Wehrmacht Gunschadel Supnet Fear, which must have had a lethal effect on the ranks of Bolsheviks, who were charging as in the days of Napoleon. However, the human tide continued to roll toward us, making our scalps crawl. Only the weight of our helmets kept our filthy hair from standing straight up on our heads, although the idea of death itself no longer terrified us. My eyes remained fixed on the smoking metal of the FM in the steady hands of the veteran. The trembling belt of cartridges moved forward into the machine, shaken as if by a titanic frenzy. Prepare the grenades, Urn shouted the stabs, who was firing with his Luger braced on his left arm. It's useless, shouted the veteran even louder. We haven't got enough ammunition. We can't stop them. Order the retreat, stabs Feldwebel, while there's still time. Our frantic eyes moved from the lips of one man to the other. The Russian war cry, Our Apobieda, roared closer and closer. The men were firing from their hips as they ran, and the air shook with the rushing flight of their bullets. You're crazy, answered the stabs. No one can get away from here, and our boys should be coming any minute now. So keep firing, for the love of God. But the veteran had already loaded his FM and picked up the last magazine. You're the one who's crazy. Any minute now is too late, but you go ahead and die right here if that's what you want.
No, no, shouted the stabs. The veteran had just jumped from the trench and was galloping toward the woods, bent over as far as he could and calling to us as he ran. We grabbed our guns in frantic haste. Run, shouted the Sudeten. We all followed him. For a moment we were almost mad with terror, racing toward the shattered trees with our lungs on fire, while Russian bullets whistled through the air all around us. There were still seven of us, which seemed astonishing. The stabs had finally followed everyone else, but was still protesting and shouting, Cowards! Shoot back! You'll all be killed! Put up a fight! But we continued to run for the trees. Halt! The stabs shouted. Halt, you cowards! We had just caught up with the veteran who had stopped for a minute behind what was left of a tree. I was right beside him. You bastard! The stabs yelled. I'll report you for this. I know, the veteran said, gasping, almost laughing. But I'd take one of our firing squads over Ivan's bayonet any day. We began to run again, climbing a pock-marked hillside stripped of its brush. Hey, e! howled the veteran as Russian bullets struck the earth bank with hollow thuds. Hurry, stabs, quick, he shouted to our leader, who was still climbing the bank and would never complete his ascent. You'll see, we'll stop them when we get to our lines. The veteran had barely finished speaking when our non-com suddenly cried out and stood up, flapping his arms in an almost comical way. Then he ran back down the little hill and collapsed, with his face pressed into the ground. Damned stabs, uh, said the veteran. I told him to hurry up. Stripped of a leader for the second time, our eighth group continued its flight through the brush, staggering under our load of weapons. Let's stop for a second, I said. I can't breathe. Hals had dropped to the ground and was trying to regain control of his breath. Behind us, we could hear guns popping and an occasional German projectile falling toward the east. As if that would stop Ivan, said the veteran. Hasn't anybody told them, for the love of God? Keep moving, boys. This is no time to take it easy. Thank God you were there, Hal said to the veteran, or we'd all be dead by now. Damn right, now beat it. We began to run again, despite the exhaustion which prevented us from grasping the critical importance of every step. Three other lands are joined us. You really scared us, one of them said. We thought you were Bolsheviks. We came to a small clearing which we could see at a glance was not a natural glade, but the site of one of our munitions dumps, which must have been hit the day before by a Russian shell. We found a few fragments of a pack, but everything else had been burned. A blackened corpse was still tangled in the branches of a fallen tree, some four yards above the ground. Suddenly we were surrounded by a full company of soldiers ready to attack. A tall lieutenant ran to meet us. Sergeant, he said, without wasting a moment. Killed, answered the veteran, pulling himself approximately to attention. Damn, said the officer, where have you come from? What company do you belong to? Eighth Group, Fifth Company, Interception Group of the Gross Deutschland Division, Herr Leutnant. Twenty-first Group, 3D Company, added the three fellows who'd just joined us. We're the only survivors. The officer looked at us but said nothing. There was a continuous rumble of guns, and from time to time the shouts of the Siberians. Where's the enemy? asked the lieutenant. In front of you, Herr Leutnant, everywhere. They just poured onto the plane. There must be several hundred thousand anyway. Keep going back. We're not part of the gross Deutschland. Reattach when you run into one of your own regiments. We didn't wait for him to repeat himself, but plunged into the brush once again, while the officer turned back to his troops, shouting his orders. We passed many other groups ready for the slaughter, finally arriving at the hamlet, where we had organized the defense post in the cellar a short time before. We stopped because a unit from our division had settled in there. But no one knew anything about the 5th Company. We were bombarded with questions, first by officers and then by anxious soldiers, but we were also allowed a few minutes rest in the shadow of a ruined house and were brought something to drink. Everywhere, harassed soldiers were digging in, constructing defensive fortifications, camouflaging, checking over what had already been done. Toward noon, we could hear the battle approaching. A salvo from the Russian artillery made us run for the cellar we already knew, where we saw a fat soldier, a gross Deutschland veteran, dancing and singing as the earth and air shook with explosions. His companions paid no attention to him. He's off his rocker, Hal said. He was that way already when we got here, someone else explained. Pretty soon we too paid no more attention to the fat lunatic who was trying to execute a French can-can. He's too much, Hal's muttered. But the madman went right on waving his arms.
In the afternoon, five or six tanks went to meet the Russians, with several groups of grenadiers right behind them. In the distance we could hear fighting, which seemed to go on for about an hour. Then we saw the grenadiers coming back, surrounded by a thick swarm of fleeing soldiers. The woods beyond the orchards were red with fire. Scattered shots were falling all around the gasping soldiers, who were dragging their wounded comrades with them. We realized that in a short time we would again be on the front line. The battle was drawing continuously closer, with its rumbling explosions and loud bursts of sound, and we felt ourselves gripped once again by the essential, inescapable anguish of the front. The counterattacks of the regiments whose positions we had crossed had been swamped, like our tanks, by the irresistible Soviet flood, for whom the most enormous losses seemed immaterial. The hamlet had become an important strategic point, jammed with machine guns, mortars, and even an anti-tank gun, which no doubt was the reason for the hell we suffered during the next thirty-six hours. Some sixty yards ahead of us, two holes had been fitted out to hide two spendows, just in front of the ones manned by the veteran and Hals, which we had reinstalled in our position of the day before. To our right, protected by the ruins, a big Geschnauz had been set up and was ready to fire, surrounded by some fifty other infantry weapons, rifles, machine guns, and grenade throwers, hidden in the ruins of four or five wooden sheds, or behind piles of wood or half-collapsed garden fences. A little further along, behind a low wall, some of the soldiers who had fled were being regrouped and set to digging new trenches. To our left, in a trench beside the only structure left more or less intact, a mortar section had set up its position, swelled by numbers of retreating infantry troops, who were reattaching themselves wherever they could. Further to the left and somewhat behind us, above the road which cut through the hamlet a 50 mm. Anti-tank gun protected by earth built up into something like a bunker was aimed toward the orchards, and behind it, somewhat lower down, a radio truck had parked beside the tractor for the gun. We had watched the truck arrive while we were resting. An endless stream of orders was pouring from our basement shelter. Officers were regrouping all the fugitives, forming emergency units, and lengthening the line of defense above the hamlet, where there must have been a command post under the authority of a superior officer. From time to time, a bullet fired at random obliged one or another of our groups to dive for the ground. But compared to what we'd been through the day before, nothing seemed particularly alarming. Only in the distance, about a mile away, violent contact persisted between the last of our retreating troops and advance Russian forces. The veteran nodded as he listened to the rush above and beyond us. Well, he kept saying, they're trying to make another Siegfried line up there. Do they really think that's how they'll stop the Ruskies? You, preacher? He turned to a chaplain. Ask your kind God to send us some lightning to help us out. We could use it since there doesn't seem to be any artillery. Everyone laughed, including the chaplain, who was less sure of his arguments now that he'd seen God's creatures tearing each other to pieces without the slightest trace of remorse. A feld looked into the shelter. What the hell's a crowd like this doing in here? Interception Group 8, 5th Company, Feld Weebel, shouted the veteran, gesturing at the six of us. The rest invited themselves in a little while ago. Okay, said the sergeant. Your group stay put, but everybody else out. There are still plenty of holes outside that need to be filled. The other men groaned and got up. Feldwebel, said the veteran. Leave us a couple of extra men to help out, in case some of us are killed. We've got to be able to hold this place. Okay. But before he was able to point to anyone, the fat lunatic who'd been dancing when we arrived proposed himself. I was a machine gunner outside Moscow, Herr Feldwebel, and nobody criticized my performance. You stay then, and that fellow over there, the rest come with me. So our group was enlarged by the fat man, whom we'd nicknamed French Can Can, and a thin, gloomy-looking character. I beg your pardon, French Can Can said to us. I hope you'll forgive me for encumbering you with my voluminous presence. You must see that digging a foxhole big enough to take me would be an awful lot of work. He began to talk, enlarging on anything that came into his head. From time to time, an explosion made him fall silent blinking his little pig eyes, but as soon as the danger was past, he would start talking again, more voluble than ever. You can set your mind at ease about the hole we'll dig for you, said the veteran without a smile. A few stones on your beer sack and that'll be it. I don't drink much beer, said French Can Can, but Howells interrupted him. 
Things must be pretty rough outside, he said. Look, there are two of our tanks coming back. The hell they're ours, said the veteran. Those are T-34s, and our anti-tank boys had better notice them. We stared at the two monsters roaring toward us. God help us, said Howells. We'll never be able to reach them with these pop guns. He began to fire the heavy machine gun, and a moment later, the tanks were surrounded by flying clods. We also saw luminous impacts on their turrets, which otherwise seemed to be undamaged. Their long tubes, waving and balancing like elephants' trunks, kept moving forward. An explosion sent us down to the floor, and a Russian shell screamed over us, before exploding somewhere beyond the hamlet. The tanks had just slowed down, and the second one was already shifting into reverse. Our Geschnauts was still firing at the two monsters, which were now lurching slowly backward. A second Russian shell hit the left-hand wall of our building and made the whole cellar shake. There were several other explosions, but we no longer dared look out. Then, an exultant shout from outside gave us a moment of courage, and we saw that the first tank, which had been knocked askew by one of our anti-tank guns, was drawing back zigzagging on a single tread. It bumped the other tank, which wobbled from the impact, and turned, offering its flank to our Gishnauts. A few minutes later, enveloped in a thick cloud of smoke, it joined the other tank, which had completed a half-turn and withdrew. One of them was spouting a thick stream of black smoke and would certainly not get very far. We could hear all our men cheering. "'You see that, boys?' exclaimed the veteran. "'That's how to make Ivan run.' We all laughed nervously except the thin, dark boy. "'Why are you looking so grim?' Hals asked him. "'I'm sick,' the other replied. "'You mean scared,' the Sudeten said. "'But that's something we've all got. "'Sure, I'm scared, but I'm sick too. Every time I have to crap, blood pours out of my ass.' You ought to go to the hospital, said the veteran. I've tried, but the major doesn't believe me. What I've got, he can't see. Yes, I guess a fellow's better off without an arm or with a big hole somewhere. That's more spectacular. Try and sleep, the veteran said, for the moment we can do without you. A mess truck had arrived at the hamlet, and anyone who had the nerve to go out could get his mess tin filled. The simple fact that we were being supplied restored some of our confidence. We felt that we hadn't lost all contact with the outside world. However, our panic returned at nightfall. The fighting flared up again with renewed violence, and in short order the rest of the German troops were retreating from the Russians, who arrived before the last of the Lancer were able to get through. We could see the oncoming Muziks everywhere outlined against the shattered orchards. They were running toward us, shouting, but the noise of our guns covered their voices. A horrible massacre had begun. In the cellar, filled with smoke from our two spendows, the air was almost unbreathable. The noise of the anti-tank gun, which must have been red-hot, had enlarged and multiplied the cracks in the ceiling, whose plaster fell onto our helmets like rain. Let's take turns firing, the veteran shouted to Howells, otherwise the guns will melt. Lindbergh, whose face had turned the color of his tunic, stuffed some dirt into his ears so that he wouldn't hear any more. A fifth belt of cartridges was running through my torn hands into the red-hot machine, which the veteran kept on firing. One of the two machine guns in front of us had been knocked out by a grenade. The other was still firing, sweeping across the ranks of Soviet troops, who were piling up in a horrible bottleneck. In spite of their desperate efforts to break through, waves of howling men were dying under our mortar and machine gun fire. We had no idea what was happening beyond our range of vision. Directly in front of us, however, the enemy was taking a terrible beating. Two or three fragments of shrapnel had come through the holes in the wall, but miraculously no one had been hit. Then we heard a heavy rumbling sound, and two or three thousand soldiers ducked their heads a little lower. In front of us, among the living and the dead, hundreds of flares lit the darkness. For a moment we were terrified. Then someone shouted, It's our artillery! Thank God, said the veteran, I'd given up on them. Okay, boys, we'll be able to stick it out. This means the Popovs can't get through. The Wehrmacht artillery had finally regrouped and was pouring down its deadly rain onto the enemy. In the darkness of our smoke-filled hole, our faces lit up with relief. That's more like it, shouted Kankan, -Kan, and look at the pounding those Ruskies are taking. That's how it ought to be. Bravo. In front of us, we could see the earth flying into the air. Lindbergh, who seemed almost mad with excitement, was yelling, Sieg Heil! at the top of his lungs. Evidently, the Russians were no better at standing up to our guns than we had been to their waves of assault the day before. The German artillery lengthened its range, 
and pursued the terrified Russians into the trees beyond the orchards. The Ura Pobieta of the Russians had been replaced by the death rattle of thousands of dying men, which filled the air with a horrible sound. We thought the hamlet had been saved. Let's have a drink, the veteran said. We really ought to celebrate. I haven't seen such slaughter the whole time I've been in Russia. We should be able to breathe a little easier now. You, he said to Lindbergh, pulling him from his corner. Go find us something instead of sitting there sniveling. It was easy to see that Lindbergh had gone mad. He was alternately laughing and crying uncontrollably. Get going, said Halls, who was fed up with him. Run and find us something to drink. He gave him a kick in the seat of his pants. Lindbergh went off, holding his head in his hands. Where will I find anything? he asked. That's your worry. At the radio truck, those fellows usually have something hidden. Or anywhere else. Just don't come back with empty hands. Outside, other soldiers were celebrating the rout of so many Popovs. In our cellar, the level of gaiety rose, too. Kankin began to dance again, and we imitated him. For a while there, I thought we were finished. Thank God the artillery stood by us. Thank God is right, laughed the grenadier, who'd been with us for three days. Tears of joy and relief were streaming from our reddened eyes and running down our blackened faces. The veteran was singing and calling for drink, and we trusted him. He had saved us that morning, and if he was rejoicing, so could we. He knew how the Russians operated and had already done a lot of fighting. He told us we would have a lull, but he was wrong. The Russian units had grown enormously and were no longer the crippled divisions which had been shoved out of Poland by the Wehrmacht and on into Russia for hundreds of miles. Times had changed. Beyond the cellar, beyond the hamlet and its trenches, beyond the thousands of Muzik cadavers and the flaming woods, the Soviet mass was moving into action again, trampling on its own dead and on ours, more powerful than ever, with hundreds upon hundreds of guns wheel to wheel. Soon their cries of victory would drown our laughter. We had become five pairs of terrified eyes staring into the murky brilliance of the orchard, which was lit by thousands of dazzling, quick-burning fires. The German lines had already been attacked three times by Soviet troops, and three times had repulsed them with extraordinary effort and bravery. Between the assaults, the big Russian guns pounded our troops and our artillery, which kept on shelling the enemy as long as it could. For five hours already our laughter had been stilled as Stalin's organs hammered at our positions, killing many of our defending troops. The rest were either killed or driven mad by bombs. A few, like our group, who had been lucky enough to dig in solidly, went on firing haphazardly with what they had left. Our ceiling had finally caved in, and the hole in the roof acted like a chimney to let the smoke escape. The tall, thin boy with dysentery had taken Hals's place at the Spandau for a few moments. A bullet or fragment of shrapnel had grazed Hal's forehead just below the visor of his helmet, and he was lying down beside three dying men who had been brought into our shelter to spend their last moments in relative tranquility. Then Hals's gun jammed and only the veteran was left firing, stiff with exhaustion, helped by Can Can, the Sudeten, and me. We felt a crushing sense of despair when Russian rockets erected a wall of white fire over our mortar trench. The Geschnauts had been dismantled, and the anti-tank gunners had given up long since. Only a few Spandaus supported by light infantry guns prevented the howling mob from taking the village. We were threatened with being overrun or surrounded any minute. I guess we'll have to die now, said the veteran. Too bad for us, but I don't see any other solution. From time to time, in the light of the flares, we could see the nest of machine gunners in front of us, heroically fighting on. The Russians pressed their attack, bringing on their tanks as soon as it began to grow light, and death to anyone who remained upright. A shell destroyed what was left of our shelter and sent us all rolling along the floor. Our cries of distress were mingled with the screams of the two machine gunners and then the shouts of revenge from the Russian tank crew as it drove over the hole, grinding the remains of the two gunners into that hateful soil. Hall stood for a moment, fascinated by the spectacle. He was the only one of us who had remained on his feet and the only one who could see what was happening. He told us later that the treads worked over the hole for a long time and that as they manipulated their machine, the Russian crew kept shouting, Kaput! Soldat Germansky, kaput. We managed to get out about ten minutes before the Russians arrived. There was no longer any question in our minds. The rest of our forces had abandoned us. God knows how we managed to drag ourselves through the dead and the chaos and the lights of the flares.
Our heads were filled with the sound of continuous explosions. It was impossible even to imagine silence. Howells was walking behind me, his hands red with blood from a wound in his neck. Lindbergh, who had finally fallen silent, was staggering just ahead of us. The veteran was a short way back, shouting imprecations against the war, our artillery, and the Russians. The fat lunatic was beside me, letting off an endless stream of incomprehensible muttering. As the noise of battle grew louder and the sky brighter, we forced ourselves into a run. "'We're finished, Zayer!' Hall shouted. "'We're not going to make it!' I began to tremble and to cry with fright. My head hurt almost beyond bearing, aching with the noise of explosions and fusillades. We kept falling, standing up again, and running on like automatons. Suddenly Can Can cried out. I turned my head to look at him through my exhausted eyes, and it seemed as if I were dreaming. I looked at him without feeling, as I moved one foot in front of the other, mechanically and with difficulty. Don't let me fall, said Can Can imploringly. His hands were clutching his belly, holding in something foul, like the offal on the floors of slaughterhouses. How can you go on like that? I asked him, only half aware of what I was saying. Suddenly he cried out again and doubled over onto himself. Come on, said the Sudeten in a thick voice like a drunkard's. There's nothing we can do for him. We staggered on like sleepwalkers. We heard the sound of an engine behind us, and turned to see what new danger might be threatening. A dark shape was jolting rapidly toward us with all its lights extinguished. We summoned up what was left of our energy and tried to scatter. The half-track, which was almost on top of us, gleamed with dull reflections of the blazing explosions all around it. "'Climb aboard, friends,' shouted a kindly soul. We stumbled toward the vehicle, which turned out to be the one that had moved the Geshnauts into position above our cellar in the hamlet. Three fellows who had also been in the hamlet had managed to get it started. We pulled ourselves onto the narrow platform, which was almost totally occupied by the heavy, dismantled gun, and the engine started up again, carrying us across a heavily rutted piece of ground which must have been the site of several gun emplacements. The soldiers standing beside piles of empty ammunition boxes waved to us as we passed, their faces drawn with exhaustion. "'Clear out!' our driver shouted to them. "'Ivan is almost here!' One of the artillery tractors was blazing brightly. Perhaps its flames dazzled our driver. In any case, we plunged nose first into a deep crater, and everyone was thrown out. I think I went through the windshield. I felt a stabbing pain in my shoulder, which was already sore, and found myself doubled over against one of the front wheels of the machine. God damn, someone said. What are you doing to us? Shut up, shouted the driver. I think I've broken my knee. I stood up, gripping my shoulder. My left arm seemed to be paralyzed. Your face is covered with blood, said the Sudeten, looking at me. Only my shoulder hurts, though. I saw Hal's lying on the ground. Already wounded, he had been thrown a considerable distance and was either unconscious or dead. I shook him and called him, and he lifted one of his hands to his neck. Thank God he wasn't dead. Somebody tried to drive our machine out of the hole, but its wheels only dug into the ground and spun helplessly. We walked on to the next artillery position, where the fellows were just pulling up stakes. They loaded us onto trucks along with their gear and we left in search of a quieter spot. In the distance, the horizon glowed red. You've come from that inferno, one of the artillerymen asked. He was talking to the veteran, who didn't answer because he'd dropped into a deep anesthetic sleep. Within a few minutes, almost everyone had done the same, despite the rough jolts of our progress. Only Hals and I remained half awake. My shoulder prevented me from moving and caused me great pain. Someone was leaning over me. My face was covered with blood. The shattered glass of the windshield had cut me in hundreds of places so that I looked as if my blood were pouring from a deep wound. This one must be dying, said the fellow looking down at me. I'm not, I shouted back. Some time later we were all helped down. Every movement hurt my shoulder, and the pain, intensified by fatigue, made me feel sick at my stomach. I began to retch and vomit violently. Two soldiers helped me to a building where the wounded were stretched out on the floor. Hals joined me with his bloody neck and our driver, who was hopping on one leg. You in a bad way, Hals asked. You're not dying, are you, sire? His words reached me through a loud buzzing noise across an immense distance. I want to go home, I said, between two spasms of retching. So do I, Hals said. He stretched out on his back and fell asleep. Some time later, we were wakened by men from the sanitary service, who had come to sort out the dead and wounded. 
I felt a set of cold fingers lifting my eyelids as someone peered into my eyes. It's all right, boy, he said. Where are you hurt? My shoulder. I can't move it. The orderly unbuckled my straps, which made me howl with pain. No visible wounds, Herr Major, he said to a tall man wearing a cap. What about his head? Nothing there, the other said. His face is bloody, that's all. And there's something wrong with his shoulder. The orderly moved my left arm back and forth and I screamed. The Major nodded, and the orderly pinned a white slip of paper to my tunic. He did the same to Halls and to the driver and then helped the driver into an ambulance which was already nearly full. Halls and I remained on the ground. Toward noon, two more orderlies came back to deal with the men like Us, who'd been left to wait. They tried to help me to my feet. That's all right, I said. I can walk. It's my shoulder that hurts. The orderlies lined up everybody who could walk, and sent Us to the canteen. Everyone strip, shouted a feld. The pain of undressing nearly made me faint. Two fellows helped me, and my swollen, battered shoulder was bared. We were each given an injection in the thigh. Then the orderlies washed our wounds with ether and stuck plaster on anyone who needed it. Beside the door they were sewing up a fellow who had a huge rip down his back and who screamed as the instruments bit into his flesh. Two of them came over and grabbed hold of my shoulder. I howled and cursed, but they paid no attention. With a cracking sound which sent spasms of pain right down to my toes, they pulled my dislocated arm back into place and moved on to the next case. I found Halls outside. They had just stuck a gauze bandage onto his neck with a long strip of tape. My friend had been wounded by a metal fragment three inches below the first wound he had received at Kharkov. Next time they'll get me in the head, he said. A short distance along, we found the veteran, the Sudeten, Lindbergh, and the Grenadier asleep and snoring on the grass. We lay down beside them and were very quickly asleep, too. And that was the end of the battle for Belgorod. The German offensive had lost all the ground it had taken at such cost during those ten days. And even more. A third of the forces engaged in the fighting had been killed, including many of the Hitler Jugend. What happened to the beautiful young man with the Madonna face and his friend with clear, loyal eyes and the student who spoke so well? Probably they were left lying on the mutilated soil of Russia, like the melancholy harmonica player who sang of his desire to return to his peaceful green valley, if only to die there. There is no sepulcher for the Germans kill it in Russia. One day some muzik will turn over their remains and pluke them under with his fertilizer, and sow his furrow with sunflower seeds.